Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, my name is Russell Keith McGee. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of me before, or if you have heard of me before, it's probably because of my work in the Python community, uh, in particular on the Django project. Uh, I've been a member of the Django core team for almost 11 years now. Uh, I was president of the Django Software Foundation from 2010 to the end of 2015. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Django, Django is a framework written in Python for rapidly developing database-backed websites. Uh, it's, the en it's the engine that's behind Instagram, Discuss, it's used at the US Library of Congress, the Australian Parliamentary Library, National Geographic, PBS, a whole bunch of others. Uh, however, my reading of the tea leaves uh, over the last few years has led me to change the focus of my open source development. Uh, these days, I'm spending a lot more of my time not on Django, but on the Beware project. Uh, B, for those who haven't come across Beware before, that's what I'm talking about today, um, Beware is an open source collection of tools and libraries for creating native user interfaces in Python uh, for traditional desktop applications, but also for iOS and Android mobile devices, single page web apps, and any other new hardware platforms that are emerging at the moment. And when I say native, I'm not talking about HTML5 apps that are delivered using Python. I'm not talking about a native shim that displays a web canvas that then renders content uh, delivered by a client-side web server. I'm talking about an app that you start the same way as you start any other app on your device uh, that's uh, developed the same, uh, that behaves the same way as a native, natively developed app behaves, that uses the same widgets as a natively developed app. Um, apps that are delivered using the normal platform mechanisms, downloaded as a single bundle from an official app store. Essentially, the end user, from my, my opinion, the end user shouldn't know, care, or be able to tell that the app that they're currently using was written using Python, any more than a user of Instagram or Discuss uh, knows or cares that the website they're using was written using Django. If the user needs to know, needs to care, or they can tell, then in my opinion, you've failed your job as a developer. Now, the mobile device space is dominated by, obviously, two major players, Android and iOS. And those players have been very much focused on pushing a single language as their preferred platform of development. If you want to write a mobile application for iOS, the official line was, you have to learn Objective-C until a sort of year or two ago, the official line changed to, you have to develop in Swift, or you should be developing in Swift. If you want to develop for Android, you have to learn Java, and a completely different set of APIs, by the way. There are a couple of other options using other languages, uh, C Sharp, JavaScript, even Ruby, for varying degrees of cross-platform and native. Um, and over the last two years, I've been working on elevating Python to the point where it is a viable option uh, for someone who wanted to develop a mobile application for these platforms, and to provide options so that they can do so in a cross-platform way. But why? Why am I even bothering? Why am I trying to do this? Well, First off, let's get this out of the way, I like Python. Uh, I think it's, got, it's an elegant, expressive, most importantly, readable language. Uh, it's got a great standard library, an even richer ecosystem of uh, tools and libraries around the outside of that. I personally love the minimalist syntax, significant white space. To me, that's just enforcing at a language level code style guidelines that are just good engineering practice. Um, many people, however, don't like Python, don't like those factors, and I'll happily argue the point with you, but I'll also accept that different people like different things. I'm not going to claim Python is perfect, but it's as close to perfect as I've ever come across, and I'm very happy living as a Pythonista. But that's a personal reason. Are there any compelling reasons why Python deserves a place on mobile as a development platform? Well, let's look at the development environment that currently exists for them from the perspective of a novice developer. The current landscape is one where polylingualism is required. Uh, there, at present, there isn't a single language that can be used on every platform as a native offering. Apple pushes Objective-C and Swift uh, as their languages. Android pushes Java. The web requires JavaScript. Server-side has a whole range of options. And if you're a professional software engineer, that isn't too much of a challenge. If you're a large company, that's not too much of a challenge. You can hire specialists in each of those domains. But what if you're not? If you're a scientist, your day job isn't programming. Programming is what helps you get your day job done. What if you're a student or someone with a casual interest in computing? Those people are having enough trouble wrapping their heads around one language, let alone four very subtly different ones. And if you're not a full-time professional programmer and you want to write a mobile app that's available on multiple platforms, then you have to learn four different programming languages. Polylingualism, be it in human languages or computer languages, is a good thing. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. There are countless studies out there that reinforce the benefits of learning a second spoken language, improvements in perception, in memory, in decision making, in problem solving. 
And this is also true of programming languages. Learning a second or third or fourth programming language, especially when it uses a completely different programming paradigm, is a great way to encourage your brain to think about problems in different creative ways. And if you're a professional computer scientist or software engineer, I'd absolutely encourage you to learn as many programming languages as you can. But that's not who I'm talking about here. I'm talking about demographics that don't want to learn multiple languages. We're talking about the programming languages of first contact. Consider the programming world 20 years ago. Visual Basic was one of the most widespread programming languages in common usage, not because it was an especially powerful programming language, but because it was present on every single Windows computer and was accessible to non-expert users and enabled those non-expert users to do really powerful things with the Office, uh, Office suite of apps. Visual Basic was their first contact programming language and many users never moved beyond it. There is immense power in being the language that people use to discover programming. And Python has repeatedly demonstrated that it is a great candidate to be a first contact programming language. From talks like this morning, uh, where we were introduced to how it's being used to get year eight students delivering uh, games into the Apple App Store, um, through to university level computer science courses, Python has been used as an introductory programming language. And yet it's also a programming language that's been able to support very sophisticated computer science concepts like generators and asynchronous processing and so on. But it's not just about people who don't have or don't want to acquire new skills. If you're a professional software engineer who has been tasked with developing a mobile app for a brand new startup, a cash strapped startup, regardless of whether you had the skills, you probably don't have the resources to run three independent software engineering projects in three different, engineer, different technology stacks a web interface, an Android interface, an iOS interface. Ideally, if you're under that sort of resource pressure, you want to be able to reuse as much code as humanly possible. Okay, so maybe you accept the premise that there's value in being able to use a single language across, across multiple platforms and having that language being accessible. Many languages could do this, but I believe Python has a particular race up its sleeve. Python is already a very popular programming language. Recent study from the IEEE placed Python fourth in the most important programming languages for software engineers to know. JavaScript came eighth, Ruby was ninth, Swift was 14th, Objective-C was 20th. And that isn't an isolated result. Uh, the Tyobi uh, index for August ranks Python fifth, again behind Java and C variants. JavaScript is seventh, Ruby is 12th, Swift is 14th, Objective-C is 15th. And that top of the table, that top five or six, is pretty stable, they don't, those, those don't move around too much. Now, C isn't a great option for teaching first-time programmers because they have to learn the intricate details of memory allocation. Uh, C++ is way too complex for most non-experts to wrap their head around in any sort of meaningful fashion. Java and C Sharp are better, but they've still got a fairly significant learning curve. When Hello World is a seven, eight line program, there's, there's some complexity there. Python is consistently the first language on these charts that is actually accessible to non-experts. And yet, it's still a language complex enough to do complex work. The reason I can say that with confidence is there is a huge breadth of domain knowledge wrapped up in Python. Through projects like NumPy, SciPy, Jupyter, BioPython, AstroPython, uh, there is a wealth of scientific experience in the scientific community that is encoded in Python libraries. Uh, Raspberry Pi, Grok Learning are leaders in the world of education and they use Python as their first contact language. This isn't just a web or a browser community or a mobile community, it is a multidisciplinary community. So why should that community be excluded from writing mobile apps? There are demographics out there where the potential for custom mobile applications is huge. Just consider the scientific angle, for example. Imagine the possibilities if a scientist could easily write an application for mobile data gathering or to facilitate uh, citizen science contributions about animal sightings or climate readings or something like that. I don't see any reason why that community should be excluded from being able to develop mobile apps because they don't know four different programming languages. And if we do provide that capability to them, I think you'll be surprised about how much they can do. Okay, so if uh, providing a mobile Python is a desirable goal, can it be delivered? Well, yes, it can. As of today, it is possible to write a completely native iOS application in Python. It's possible to write a completely native Android application in Python and to write cross-platform applications from the same API. Let's start with iOS. Uh, I'm going to start there, obviously, because this is an Apple event. Um, but it's actually also the easier of the two to get going. Um, it's easier because the tool chain that you use to develop native iOS applications is Clang, the same C compiler that you use to compile CPython for a Mac. 
Now, that doesn't mean that iOS is just a POSIX, not quite that simple, but it's you know, close enough to first approximation. For those of you who are familiar with Python, when you start a Python shell or you run a Python script on your laptop or on your server, chances are what you're actually doing is running CPython, effectively the reference implementation of the Python language specification written in C. One of the side effects of being written in C is that it's really easy to port new platforms. With a few patches, disabling a few modules in the standard library, you can just take the Python 2, Python 3 sources, compile them up so they can run on the iOS simulator or on an ARMv6, ARMv7, ARMv7s, ARM64 uh, architectures, which basically covers every iOS device that's in common usage today. Okay, so how does that work in practice? Well, you don't have a command line interface where you can type Python minus M my app. Uh, so how do you use CPython on iOS? Well, you treat it as an embedded application. You write a very small C stub, your, your main.c stub file, which is the entry point for iOS. It starts up the CPython library uh, as an embedded library and then starts the iOS event loop. Now, I could dig into all of that in extraordinary detail, but honestly, there's no point, mostly because it's pretty much a vanilla usage of embedded Python as described in the Python documentation but also because it's frankly just easy to template it. Um, Python iOS template is a cookie cutter pattern you can use to generate an entire ready to run iOS project. Uh, for those who don't know about it, cookie cutter is a Python tool that lets you template entire directories of content. Um, so you can template the contents of individual files, but also the names of files and directories. And using that, you can generate, for example, an entire Xcode project directory that fills in the blanks every time you need to put in my project name or my Xcode credentials or whatever else needs to be in that file. Once you've got that stub project, you actually want to do something. You could start by writing hello world, but that's not going to be particularly enlightening because it's just going to output content to standard output, which is forwarded to the console um, when it's compiled on, on device, uh, which is great because you can see it during Xcode, but it isn't, it isn't visible from a standalone iOS device unless it's plugged in. So what you really want to do is invoke native iOS APIs. So how do you do that? Well, iOS native libraries, little known fact, are well, a well known fact, are provided in Objective-C. Little known fact, Objective-C is actually really compatible with Python. The message passing approach that Objective-C takes maps really well to Python's dynamic dispatch mechanism. So as an example, here's some sample code uh, for Objective-C creating a URL object. So we're saying we're passing the URL with string message to the NSURL class, providing an, object, an argument that's a native Objective-C string, getting an NSURL object as a result. Nothing too surprising there. A critical difference between C++ and Objective-C, though, is that this is done at runtime, not as a compile time activity. That is not going and finding a URL with string method and encoding that as, a, as a, a, a reference in a library. It's dynamically passing a message to an object. So how do we perform Objective-C message passing in Python? Well, little known fact, the, the Objective-C um, uh, runtime is designed as a syntactic wrapper over raw C. Uh, the quirky Objective-C square bracket syntax is literally a translation to raw C API calls. So let's roll this out a little bit, see what it looks like. We'll start by rolling out the symbolic uh, syntactic shorthand. Um, uh, so we'll manually construct an ns string instead of using an at string. Uh, so that converts everything down to using a raw c string and an init with characters um, uh, constructor. Uh, now, so at this point, we have taken out all the objective c data types. We just have the raw messages we want to pass around. So we can translate that into a raw c API. This here is exactly and I do mean exactly the same code, but written in raw C, not in Objective-C. So you get the class reference called NSString, you get the alloc selector, you send the alloc message to the NSString class. It gives you back an object. Get the init with characters length selector, you send that message along with two arguments to the allocated string object. Then you get the NSURL URL object, you get the URL with string selector, use that selector to initialize the new NSURL, NSURL object. And what you're left with at the end of the day is a pointer to a URL, ID is just a void star pointer effectively, to a URL that you can then pass around as an Objective-C object and pass any other messages you want to that. So, okay, that's raw C. You could sit down and write that in a raw C compiler and off it'll run. 
How do you get that to that from Python? Well, part of the C Python standard library is a package called C types. C types is a library that exploits the fact that at the assembly language level, the way you invoke a function, what's known as the calling convention, the calling convention used by C compilers is well defined. Since it's well defined, it means you don't have to use a C compiler to generate uh, the, what will be interpreted as a function call. Any tool that can generate a compatible sequence of assembly language instructions can invoke any function in any library, regardless of what that language, what language is doing the calling or what language the library was originally written in. So there is a helper library called FFI, the Foreign Function Interface, uh, that makes this really easy to do. And C types is Python's built-in wrapper around FFI. So using C types, all you have to do is reference the existence of a C library, tell Python that this C library exists, um, and then tell it the prototype for any given method in that library, and you can invoke that method directly without having to compile anything. So, for example, here we can use C, uh, C types to load the libc library. So that's the standard C library that comes as just the built-in part of a C compiler. Uh, we can tell that library that there is a function called stercher. Uh, it takes a C character pointer, a C char p, and it takes a, a, a C character, a C char. It returns a C character pointer. We can then invoke that method directly. We can say libc.stercher, pass in a byte string and a, and, a, and a byte, and we get back a string. And so there we have it. We've just invoked a raw C function from inside Python, and we can do that at runtime without compiling anything. So if you can invoke C libraries directly, it means you can also invoke Objective C directly. So let's take that very first call to the NS string. We can load the Objective C library, tell it that that library has a Objective C get class method that takes a character pointer and returns a generic object pointer. We can then invoke it and get back a pointer to the NS string class that we can then use in subsequent calls to uh, analogous sets of APIs. Okay, well that's neat. How does that help us? Well, Python is a very dynamic language. Most aspects of the way the language runs at runtime can be configured and overridden, including basic things like attribute access. Python uses this uh, double, double underscore or dunder syntax uh, to describe methods that have some form of internal significance. So if you des describe a class that has a dunder getattr method, any attempt to access an attribute on that object will be turned into a call on that dunder getattr method. Similarly for attempts to set an attribute using dunder setattr. And we can then use that to our advantage. So if we've got an Objective C, in syntax, uh, Objective C instance and someone invokes dot something, an object dot spam on that particular object, I can use that as a trigger behind the scenes to make the underlying Objective C call find a selector that, matters, um, that matches and retrieve the attribute with that selector, giving me back the value of that attribute or con uh, subsequently setting the value of that attribute as well. Python also allows you to intercept the process of invoking a function. So if a class implements a dunder call method, then if someone tries to invoke that object as a function, uh, it will call dunder call. So again, we can use that as a trigger. So when someone constructs this method object and then they call the instance with some arguments, that's effectively just saying call dunder call with those arguments, hook that up to the underlying Objective-C mechanism, mechanisms for calling a function, and you're off to the races. Lastly, Python gives you the power to control the process of object construction. This happens at two levels. If you've done any sort of Python before, you're probably familiar with dunder init. That's effectively uh, Python's constructor. So you can say, okay, here's my instance. This is how I want to initialize this particular instance. But there is also a dunder new. Dunder new is the process by which dunder init is, is effectively called. So it's the process of constructing instances, not just the process of instantiating instances. Um, and so you can use that dunder new to slip in there and say, okay, I'm going to bind this particular Python instance or this particular Python class to this underlying Objective-C object. So if you put all of those pieces together, what you get is Rubicon. It's a library that is a transparent Python side access to the entire Objective-C runtime. Any published iOS API, any published Objective-C API is now fair game. You don't have to have a configuration file somewhere saying what's available. So, using, object, using Rubicon, uh, accessing Objective-C libraries becomes as simple as load the foundation libraries, for example, or any other library you, you know that there's something uh, that contains an interesting function. Uh, get an access to an object, so the NSURL object, for example, are gonna, the, it's in Objective-C, it's called NSURL, I'm just going to map that to exactly the same symbol in, on, on the Python side. And then I can pass in the URL with string with one argument message, 
to NSURL. Now, this is being dynamically generated based purely upon the name of the attribute I'm requesting on that class. The uh, only conceit there is that the colons in your, uh, uh, in your selector names have been replaced with underscores purely because of syntactic constraints inside Python. Uh, colons are reserved character you can't use in, a, in an identifier. And again, to be clear, this is possible because Objective-C does runtime message passing and all we've done is hijack the internal Objective-C mechanism for passing that message around and hooked it up to Python's dynamic mechanisms for attribute lookup and message invocation. Now, you can even go further and say extend an Objective-C class in your Python namespace and get and declare methods that need to be exposed in the Objective-C environment. You just need to know, you just have to decorate them to let the type construction process know, hey, this method needs to be registered on, uh, with the Objective-C runtime. Uh, this can be really handy when you're uh, defining a callback, for example. But hang on, wait a second. Objective-C is a typed language, so how do you represent that typing information? Well, Python 3 has uh, type annotations. Uh, it's not a feature that's particularly well known. It's been there since Python 3.0. It's only really hit people's radar uh, quite recently. But it's completely legitimate syntax. So I can say here, init with value takes an argument v. That v is an integer. And at, uh, at runtime, uh, the Rubicon backend can take that type information and use that as the basis for looking for a particular typed version of a method uh, in the Objective-C runtime. Now, again, to be clear, this isn't a custom language extension or anything legal Python has been since Python 3.0. It's just slightly off-piste usage. From here, it's just a matter of defining the right classes, invoking the right iOS methods, but you can use any iOS textbook to guide that process. Stick this code into your cookie cutter template, you've got a working pure Python, completely native iOS uh, application. Now, if you've written iOS apps before, this should look fairly familiar. Uh, so we've got a uh, app delegate that exposes an application, did finish launching with options, which accepts an application and a launch options and returns a Boolean. We've got a my view controller, which is in a subclass of UI view controller. It has a load view that returns nothing, and so on and so on. Now, this isn't iOS specific. Uh, Mac OS is Objective-C under the hood as well. So all the techniques I've described so far work perfectly well for desktop apps. You need to change some of the class names. Uh, it's NS view controller, not UI view controller. But again, you don't have to pre-declare that. You've just got to say at runtime which classes you want to be able to pull out of your uh, foundation library. Interestingly, this basic approach applies to a whole lot of dynamic languages. Um, I've used Python here because I like Python, but many other languages provide sufficient metaprogramming control over the attribute lookup process and provide bindings to FFI. You could do the same thing in almost any other of one of those languages. Actually doing so is left as an exercise to the reader, but you know, it can be done. Now, since this is an Apple-focused con uh, con uh, conference, Many of you are probably asking, well, hey, what about Swift? How does, doesn't that change everything? We're not using Objective-C anymore. That's, that's the old thing. Well, there's two answers, depending upon the question you're asking. First off, from a technical perspective, does this change anything about whether the approach is technically feasible? Apple's new focus on Swift doesn't appear to be changing anything from Python's perspective. Swift does, don't get me wrong, looks really interesting as a language, um, but ultimately it's really just a sort of set of syntactic sugars around the existing Objective-C runtime. Some compiler optimizations and things going on as well, to be sure, but the fact that they're able to document every API as the Objective-C version and the Swift version betrays the fact that there's some commonality going on under the hood there. So if it's Objective-C under the hood still, we can still invoke it. Um, there aren't any signs at the moment that Objective-C is going away other than uh, Apple not talking about it. But even if it did, Swift is still built on the Clang toolchain. There's still going to be a way in. Uh, it's early days, but there's always already work on libffi extensions to support Swift's calling convention. And even if they're, you know, Swift is an open source project, so we'd be able to get in there and have a look to see exactly what it's doing. The other question, is Swift a better answer than Python as a first contact programming language? Well, despite Apple's open sourcing of the Swift language, I don't think it poses an immediate threat to Python's position. Remember, Objective-C has been an open source programming language for almost as long as it's been a language, and it didn't take over the world. Part of that is due to some very odd syntactic choices. Um, the critical part is that all that Apple ever open sourced was the language, not the foundation libraries, not Cocoa. So yeah, Apple has open sourced Swift, which makes it a lot more attractive as a language, but they haven't open sourced any part of the Swift ecosystem that actually lets you do anything useful. 
The Swift language community still has a lot of work to do before it's even at parity with what Python can do in terms of support for the needs of any user who isn't already on an Apple platform. Like, for example, Android. And that's not just me talking. If you go to the official Swift repository on GitHub, the very first question on the Android support doc say, does this mean I can write Android applications in Swift? No. Although the Swift compiler is capable of compiling Swift code that runs on an Android device, it takes a lot more than just the Swift standard library to write an app. Uh, it goes on a little bit later on and says, alternatively, one could theoretically call into Java interfaces from Swift, but the Swift compiler does nothing to facilitate Swift to Java bridging. So, if you're moving to Android, you're still going to have to do something um, unusual. Does Python fare any better on Android? Well, you can, theoretically, use the same approach uh, as you use on iOS. Compile CPython, link to it as an embedded library. But there is a very big caveat, and this is what was being alluded to in the answer about Swift. You can't use the C-type trick, or at least there's very big caveats on using the C-type tri trick to invoke native libraries, because the native libraries aren't exposed as C functions. They're exposed as Java. Now, if you're using desktop Java, you can use JNI, the J J uh, Java native interface, uh, and that's fairly, fairly efficient. You know, on the desktop, Sun slash Oracle has recognized that JNI is an important way of getting access to the system, and they've made it quite fast, quite efficient. There's no obvious constraints. But on Android, there is a hard limit of 2,000 object references hard-coded into the Android kernel, and on some devices, it's much lower. And you need one of those references for every data type, every method name, every object instance you reference. To start a Hello World application and fully instantiate all the classes involved in Hello World, you need 4,000 references. So that means you have to do a whole lot of attribute lookup and caching, which means also there's going to be repeated lookups. And the lookup process is slow. So effectively, it means that that process isn't really viable for building user-facing apps. By the by, um, this restriction is something that will exist for Swift as well. Um, and that's what we're referring to about the Swift Java bridging. So is there another way of tackling this? Well, yes, there is, at least for Python anyway. Let's take a simple Python function. It sings you a little song. OK, so for i in range, zero to, uh, 100 down to 0, moving down to minus 1s, print how many bottles of beer there are on the wall. Fantastic. When you run that program, Python parses it and compiles it into an intermediate format called bytecode. Bytecode is a bit like a high-level assembly language. It's a stack-based machine, or virtual machine, uh, with some basic primitives for doing things like pushing and popping values onto a stack. Python also gives you the tools to inspect that bytecode. So the dis module lets you disassemble any function or class or whatever into the bytecode representation for that, uh, for that function. So if we run dis over our little sing method, what do we get? You get the raw bytecode instructions. Now this is in a human readable format. It's actually binary when it's stored on disk. Um, but hopefully it makes some sort of sense. We, we're going to set up a loop. We're going to configure the range of that loop. We're going to load a constant, uh, a, a range function into, uh, into memory. We're going to load three constants, 100, 0, minus 1. And then we're going to call a function. So it'll be calling that function with three arguments, because we said there's three arguments. We're going to get an iterator. We're going to iterate over things, and so on and so on. OK, that's nice. So what? Well, let's do the same thing for Java. Here's the same program, give or take. We compile this with Java C. We get a sing.class file. And if we dig open that class file, what do we see? You see bytecode. OK, now it's a different bytecode to Python's bytecode, but it is also stack-based. And there's a lot of commonalities. You're loading and storing variables. Uh, you're getting symbols. You're pushing constants onto a stack. You're making comparisons based upon the values in the stack. So if they're both bytecode and they're both stack-based, can we convert from one to the other? Well, yes, but strangely, the easiest approach actually isn't to type tackle it at the bytecode level, but a little bit higher up. The Python standard library, again, contains the tools that Python itself uses to parse and compile Python code. And one of those modules is the AST, the abstract syntax tree. This module, you give it a chunk of code, and what it gives you back is a tree form representation of what that code is. So here we have a function definition that has a series of arguments, sorry, it takes no arguments, and has a body. The first statement in the body is a for loop. The for loop is iterating over a call. The name of the call is range. Uh, it also takes in three arguments, num1, uh, num100, num0, and num minus one, and so on and so on. Being a tree data structure, it's extremely easy to walk and therefore very easy to use as the basis for transformation into another form. 
And this is what a project called Voc does. Voc is a tool, again, written in Python, that you can use to convert Python 3 code directly into Java bytecode files. We're not doing source code transformation here. We're saying, here is the context. Generate a Java class file that does the same thing. The Java compiler isn't involved here. We are producing a Java class file directly, and it's indistinguishable from one produced by Java C to the Java runtime's perspective anyway. This means you can use it to bridge seamlessly between Python and Java and vice versa. There's a couple of small caveats on that, but for the most part, you just write your Java code, but in Python. It also means because we're manipulating bytecode, we can do things that the Java language itself doesn't allow, like generators. So you can issue the bytecode instructions to perform very odd jumps back and forth inside your call stack to provide behavior that is completely natural to Python users but cannot be represented in Java, the programming language. And lastly, because it's not a runtime implementation, when the code inevitably, inevitably breaks due to some programming error, the stack traits you, uh, traces you back to the points in the lines of Python code that were actually responsible for that problem. So, as with iOS, that means you can take these standard textbook Android APIs, convert them into Python the syntax, compile Java class files, and, well, profit, I guess. Here's a snippet of some Android code setting up a main activity that's sort of the entry point of, a, of an application. We're going to import a list view. We're going to say this activity extends an Android activity. When it's created, it receives a bundle as part of its state. We're going to call it super method. We're going to log something. We're going to construct a list view, and so on and so on. Now, again, this is using Python 3 type annotations and to provide the information needed uh, to bind to the underlying strongly typed Java methods. And as with iOS as well, there's a bunch of housekeeping that's needed to actually get this running under Android. Now, there's a cookie cutter for that too. Run cookie cutter over the template, download the pre-compiled Android support libraries. And it'll even manage compiling the Python code in your project to Java, packaging it up as needed. Again, full instructions on the GitHub page that's there if you're interested. Okay, so. So far, we've been talking about writing a native iOS application using iOS APIs. We can ship that. We can write a native Android application using native Android APIs and ship that. So we've made it possible for our Android to write their application in the same language, but the two APIs are completely different. Can we bridge that gap? Is it possible to write code once and have it run on multiple platforms? Now, when I say cross-platform widget toolkit, most people who have spent any time in the industry have some sort of involuntary gag reflex. Um, if you've been in the industry for a while, you've been down this path before, and the results have been less than spectacular. Now, my argument is that the reason for that is that most cross-platform toolkits have done it wrong. Let's have a look at the approaches that different widget toolkits have used in the past. Option one, reinvent the wheel. This is the approach that's used by things like PhoneGap, uh, Kivi, if you're familiar with that one in the Python space. Instead of trying to deliver the same functionality on different platforms, they say, let's be native nowhere. Let's treat the device as a blank canvas. Uh, we'll start from there, and we'll invent every widget from scratch. Now, that approach can be all you need for some situations. Really good for games, for example, because you honestly don't want system native widgets in the middle of your game. You just want your pixel of a castle bricks that looks like a button. You know, you're pressing that, and you invade the castle, whatever. Um, but if you're trying to provide an app experience that meshes with the rest of your uh, user's phone, that approach doesn't work so well. And that's not just a matter of taste either. Both Android and iOS have all sorts of affordances built into them to deal with accessibility issues. Yes, you can implement those yourself, but they tend not to be because it's yet one more complicated thing that you've got to build in. And you know, it's not, not most people who are writing games, for example, don't have accessibility at the front of their mind. A second option, theming. What can't you fix with a theme? This is where you come up with an API, and then you go to extreme lengths to draw widgets that look native wherever you deploy them. This is, in my opinion, the lipstick on a pig option. Because no matter how hard you try, you never get it quite right. Even if your rendered theme is pixel perfect, you inevitably miss some subtle UI interaction detail. You know how long a button stays depressed or the speed at which some shading disappears. And even if you get that right, the next version of the operating system will come out, move everything two pixels to the left and miss with all, your, all of your look and feel. This is the approach that's taken by TK and every single time a new version of OS X comes out, the TK rendering looks a little bit uh, It was also what early versions of Qt used, used. But the proof of why it's a bad idea is best displayed by GTK on Mac OS. Uh, GTK supports OS X, it says on the box. And that means that if you run an X server, 
um, you might get something that looks very much like Unix on your Mac. So there's a menu bar in every window, which is, of course, exactly what you're looking for when you want a native application running on, running on your Mac. So in fairness, this can be done well in some cases. Uh, this is usually done by falling back on native widget rendering rather than drawing the rendering yourself. Newer versions of Qt, Swing, the Eclipse Standard Widget Toolkit take this approach. Uh, it's five minutes, okay, right. Um, and, and the Eclipse Standard Widget Toolkit takes this approach. And it does it a lot better, but it still misses some key details. For example, consider menu bars again. Good widget toolkits will get this right. And on Mac OS, they'll provide a screen level menu bar. But what's in that menu bar? Where does the quit menu go? On Windows, it goes under the file menu. On Mac OS, it goes under the app menu, which is a menu that Windows doesn't have. Another example, how do you render a yes, no question? On iOS, you use a switch. On Android, you use a checkbox, although there is also a switch widget that's available. My position is that what we need here is a different approach to cross-platform widgets. Most cross-platform widget toolkits start with the widgets and then work back to get a common API. The widget-first approach works for all the common stuff like buttons. But as soon as you hit an edge case, you either have to leave a widget out um, checkbox is an implement on iOS, for example, or you implement a workaround, implementing checkbox for iOS, uh, resulting that the UI violates the user experience guide for that platform. I'm suggesting a different approach. Instead of starting with the widgets, start with the concepts that you want to represent and work back to the widgets that allow those concepts to be represented. So the question isn't, how do I represent a checkbox on iOS? It's, how do I pose the user a yes, no question? which just happens to be with a switch on iOS, but on Android, it would be a checkbox for a yes, no question. But if you had something like enable or disable feature, you might use a switch. In a similar way, we know that uh, all desktop applications need a quit menu on them. Instead of providing a way to add a quit item to a menu and then requiring app builders to put in the logic to work out where that quit actually happens or where, where it fits, you provide an abstract concept of quitting, which can be enabled. And when it's enabled, it knows where it needs to be. And this is where Toga comes in. Toga is a cross-platform widget toolkit that uses system-native widgets exposed using this abstraction-based uh, UI approach. It started on desktop platforms for OS X, Linux, and Windows. I've been focusing on mobile uh, recently to provide a compelling reason for adoption. Uh, at the implementation level, Toga is a wrapper around system-native calls. It uses the approaches I've described so far to hook directly into system-native mechanisms for displaying a button uh, responding to a click but it also provides a common abstraction-based API for controlling those native widgets. But if you do happen to need to get down to the core system, you've got access to all of that. It's all just one sort of one object reference away. You can invoke all of the native APIs if you need to. Bit of a taster for what Toga looks like in practice. To find an app, um, we're gonna, when it starts up, we're going to put a create a list object with uh, two responses. When things are deleted from this list, or when the user requests to delete something from this list, and when the user requests to refresh something from this list. Note that the handles there are not top left-hand corner button or swipe. It's the action the user actually semantically wants to do, delete an option. Um, startup method describes a container that's going to hold the list. We set the main window to be the app that this container is, is going to hold this container. Um, we're going to have an input which is going to be a text input. We're going to have an item dialogue. The dialogue is going to display and have some content in it as well. Um, and then we've got some callback functions. We show the add dialogue, so on. Um, if you want to see this in action, there's a video uh, uh, of a full version of this app running on iOS. It's a simulator in the movie, but it does work on device as well. And Android, for bonus points, almost exactly the same code running as a single page web app, uh, which means Python code running in the browser, utilizing a user interface declared entirely in Python. One or one and a quarter source code bases, three apps, all platform native. There's also links to the source code. But you don't have to go to all that trouble. You're actually looking at a Toga application right now. This presentation tool I'm using is called Podium. Uh, it's written in Python. It's running as a native application in Python, full screen, on a Mac. On, on a Mac. Um, it's written using Toga. It doesn't currently run under Linux, um, but that's only because I haven't been playing around with GTK for a little bit. Um, it would be relatively easy to port if anybody does want a platform native uh, presentation tool for Linux or Windows as you go. Uh, actually, I might skip this bit and move on to... All right. so what does the future hold? Well, there's still plenty of work to be done. All the projects I've talked about today, Rubicon, Voc, Toga, Briefcase, these are all works in progress, especially with Toga. There's still a lot of work needed there. Uh, collectively, these tools make up the Beware project. Uh, they're all open source projects under a BSD license. 
If anything I've spoken about today sounds interesting, um, I'd certainly appreciate any help that you care to offer, especially if you are platform experts on Android and iOS. Um, I've also got an open offer for anybody who's never contributed to open source before to, um, uh, to mentor you into being a contributor on open source projects. While my focus today has been very strongly in the Python world, I don't for a second want to claim that Objective-C, Swift and Java should be replaced wholesale with Python. There will always be a place for learning Objective-C, learning Swift, learning Java, developing a finely tuned, honed developer experience. What I'm advocating for here is the let a hundred flowers bloom approach. For those who don't know the phrase, Mao Zedong during the early days of Chinese communism uh, said, uh, the policy of letting a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought contend is designed to promote the flourishing of the arts and the progress of science. Of course, about a year after he said those words, he cracked down on everybody who didn't disagree with him or who disagreed with him and killed them all. But, you know, we don't follow all those examples. My argument to, to you is that the monolingual silos of app development on iOS, Android and macOS aren't good for the industry. Many of the areas where Python has gained traction, in science, in education, these are areas where mobile has the potential to make a huge impact. The people who are engaged in the areas where they can make those, make those impacts, um, they're not stupid. They've got PhDs in particle physics and things like that, but they're also not interested in learning four computer programming languages just so they can have an app in their hand. As an industry, we need to reach out to them, broaden our horizons when it comes to considering who might be using our technology, and what, where possible, uh, and wherever possible, encourage our vendors to do the same and break up these, uh, um, these silos. So, Anvil, um, if you've spoken, if you've interested in anything, again, uh, this is how you contact me. Um, I don't know if we have time for a few questions, but uh, no, we're all fresh out. But I'm certainly around for the rest of today. So, um, thank you very much. Okay.